my lovely love bugs and welcome to part two of our update on, on 2021 of the Asian giant hornet. Last week I talked a little bit about the history, what you can do to help, what's going on with them, how we found them, all that kind of stuff. So if you want kind of like an update update about most current information, that would be in that video. This video is answering all of your questions because you, you asked big brained questions. So they're not that easy to answer as usual. Whenever I ask questions, you all seem to have like questions. Many of you love bugs asked kind of like the same vein of questions. So I'm gonna kind of broaden the questions out a little bit and answer a couple uh, per theme. So you're gonna see the questions pop up in screen as I'm talking about them. So the first main group theme of questions was really asking about their spread. Like how quickly can they spread? How quickly can they establish? Like what happens once they establish? All those kinds of things. So we're gonna take that as one chunk right now. The best evidence we have for how quickly they could potentially spread comes from the European hornet, which was introduced to Arkansas in 1999. So like not that long ago, like 20, 20 ish years ago, it was introduced. And in those 20 years, it really hasn't spread that far. It's only spread to a handful of states and also hasn't become like invasive. We're not worried about the European hornet because it didn't take over the ecosystem. It's not really in any meaningful way affecting agriculture and it's not really in any meaningful way affecting the local ecosystem. This is what we call a naturalized or it has basically integrated into the ecosystem. It is non-native, but it is also like not really a problem. And from what we know about that insect, the European hornet, is it really didn't get very far in 20 years and didn't really cause a big deal. Using the European hornet as a model, we don't really think that the Asian giant hornet is going to get very far very quickly. My friend Eric Eaton, who wrote this book on wasps, he's an excellent science communicator and knows a lot more about wasps than I do. He obviously he wrote a whole book about it that I need to read. It, it's very beautiful though. I highly recommend this book. Hashtag I'm not sponsored. Hashtag please sponsor me. <laughs> uh, anyway, a very beautiful book about wasps and, and their biology and stuff like that. Eric Eaton has this to say about the situation. I'm going to read it because I don't want to mince words. I think the big one is once established in North America, how far are they likely to spread and how fast? Judging by the European hornet history, not that far and at a relative snail's pace. We need to stop trapping for them south of Oregon and Wyoming. And that kind of leads back into what I said, using the European hornet as the model, probably not very far and probably not very fast. We do have a lot of unknowns though. And many entomologists who are working on this are very cognizant of those unknowns. If we look at the worst case scenario, we know that the Asian giant hornet can fly about 70 miles in a year. So the idea is worst case scenario that it could make it outside of Washington into Oregon or into Wyoming in the next 20 ish years, which is kind of a long time to not get out of the state. But that is using data on the workers. The workers are not the ones that are reproducing. The ones that are reproducing are the queens. So we have a lot more questions and a lot more unknowns about these queens. Once they hibernate, how far do they fly from their hibernation site to a nesting site? If we can go on the two data points that we have from the past couple of years, three data points, the three nests that we have from 2019 to now, uh, they're all still within a 50 mile radius. And the two nests that were found in the United States were found within two miles of each other. So maybe they aren't even going to go that far once they have hibernated and find a nesting site. So how far do they go after their hibernation site? And how many times do they fly? Do they just, do they just see how far they can get in a day? Do they take a rest and go fly again another day looking for the proper habitat? We don't know. And then the next question is, do they even like nesting near the hibernation site? So if it's close, are they likely to sit there and just nest super close to the hibernation site or are they wanting to go further afield? All of these questions are basically big giant question marks and we don't know, so check back later and we might have more data for you. Transport by humans is very unlikely. Obviously the Asian giant hornet got here somehow. 
We don't know how it got here though. That's kind of like the big question mark. And to me right now isn't even the thing that we should be focusing on. Obviously knowing how they got here will help us in the future possibly stop other non-native species from entering. But you know, usually it's in shipping containers. One of the invasive mosquitoes in Georgia, for example, came in a used tire shipment. So usually coming over in some sort of shipment that isn't checked as well as it maybe should be or could be, and that has a lot to do with the amount of shipments that come into the country versus the amount of people we can actually employ to look at all of the different boxes. There's, there's a lot, big disconnect there. So anyway, the Asian giant hornet got here somehow. Uh, we're not really sure how, but we don't think that human transport within the United States is going to contribute much to their spread because again, you need to move a mated queen. And moving a mated queen uh, is unlikely and probably difficult. Not impossible as we have seen, but probably unlikely and difficult. Another question about their potential spread is how are they going to handle the extreme hot or the extreme cold? Like if they get to California or, you know, they get to further north. We have a lot of problems with non-native species coming specifically from Asia because the United States climate, especially in the north part of the United States, and the climate in Japan and China is not that different. That's why a lot of ornamental plants can grow in the United States when they've been brought in from Japan or China. Our habitat and our climate is very similar. So these insects can handle hot summers and they can handle cold winters by hibernating and overwintering. I think more of what is going to stop their spread is due to like how far they can get in a certain period of time and maybe more like geological features like the Rocky Mountains is going to be more of a problem than just like, it's a hot summer in California. Again, time will tell. Maybe this will age poorly and I'll look like an idiot, who knows? Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Nancy. For those of you who don't know me, I am an entomologist, which means that I study insects and I live in Quito, Ecuador, where normally I am doing bug tours, toting your bum around the jungle to look at all the beautiful ecosystems and all the beautiful insects. But when I'm not doing that, I'm here on YouTube telling you about bugs. So basically I'm just telling you about bugs in any way that you want to consume it. The next really big question I get is all about how dangerous are they about their stings, what they can do to you, your family, your pets, your loved ones, et cetera, et cetera. It is important to note that the murder hornets are not murdering anyone except for honeybees. That is the biggest concern right now is how they will affect our bee agriculture and apiaries and beekeeping because a colony of Asian giant hornets can kill an entire colony of honeybees pretty quick. Japanese honeybees that live in the same area as the Asian giant hornet have this ability where when a scout hornet finds the Japanese honeybees, the Japanese honeybees can react quickly, envelop that scout hornet in a bee ball, vibrate and shiver a lot until it heats up the bee ball and cooks the Asian giant hornet, which is pretty amazing. And that works because the Asian giant hornet has a lower temperature threshold than the Japanese honeybees, but not by much. European honeybees that have never encountered the Asian giant hornet do not have any ability to combat the Asian giant hornets. And that's where the problem is. Are the Asian giant hornets particularly dangerous to you? No, not really. How dangerous are they? Not very. Let's look at some stats. In Japan and China, they tend to kill between 30 and 50 people a year, which sounds like a lot, but when you look at how many people live in each of those countries, it's actually a very small percentage. And most of that is happening because of allergic reaction, which is what a lot of people die from in, with honeybees in the United States. In fact, the CDC has reported an increased number of human deaths by honeybees in the United States in the past few years, with 2018 peaking at 89 deaths per year due to honeybees, where the average is about 65, 50 to 65 
people per year. So Asian giant hornet deaths in their native country is on par with honeybee deaths here in the United States. So we would expect it to be about the same. Again, it has mainly to do with people who are allergic to bee stings who get stung rather than just being like rather than just one hornet is killing you. These hornets are big. You are significantly bigger. I know it talks about the venom load, which we're gonna talk about in a second, and I know it talks about like this potent venom and all this stuff. But remember that we are a 150-ish pound animal compared to a two-inch animal that weighs a couple grams. How painful is their sting? Uh, Justin Schmidt wrote this book, The Sting of the Wild, which I highly recommend because it not only talks about how much the different stings hurt, what they feel like with his Schmidt pain index on a scale of zero to four, but uh, also talks about how the chemicals are working. Justin Schmidt had not yet been stung by an Asian giant hornet, but has been stung by other hornets and ranked one of the other hornets on this list at a 2.5. And when doing research on this, other people who have been stung by both the Asian giant hornet and other hornets say that the sensation is like being stabbed by a red hot needle, says Sunichi Makino, who studies wasps and bees at Japan's Forestry and Forest Products Research Institute. Not only that, but the anguish lingers. Usually the stung part severely swells and continues aching for a few days, Makino explains via email. And although you could also have these symptoms when stung by other hornet species, the intensity is said to be much more severe in Vespa mandarinia. Soichi Yamane got stung on the job. He was a wasp researcher, now retired, and he confirms Makino's description. The pain lasted two days, and my sleep was often disturbed by severe pain. Yeah, for comparison, the tarantula hawk is a four on this scale, and Schmidt writes that it is blinding, fierce, shockingly electric. A running hairdryer has just been dropped into your bubble bath. And honeybees are at like a two, so there you have it like somewhere in the middle. It hurts, you're not gonna die, most likely, unless you're allergic. Now if we look at how deadly the venom is, venom is measured in deadliness by what is called an LD50. The lethal dose, or the LD50, is measured by how much venom does it take to kill half of your test subjects, usually mice or rats. And this is done in some sort of ratio between amount of venom and body weight of critter. The smaller the number in front, so the smaller, because we measure venom first, so the less venom it takes to kill half the subjects, the more venomous it is. You'll be surprised to know that our hornet friends, the Asian giant hornets, come at 4.1 milligrams per kilogram is the LD50. Honeybees are actually more toxic. They have an LD50 of 2.8 per kilogram, and the most dangerous insect in North America is the harvester ant at 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. So there you have it. Like surprising, the Asian giant hornet is actually less toxic than honeybees. The difference between Asian giant hornet and honeybees is that honeybees can only sting once before they keel over and die, and the Asian giant hornet can sting multiple times and may have up to 10 times the venom load of a honeybee. Still, when you put all of these stats into comparison, you would still need to be stung between 100 and 500 times by an Asian giant hornet colony to suffer ill effects if you are not allergic. If you're allergic, one sting. Doesn't matter from what. Could be a honeybee, could be an Asian giant hornet. If you're allergic, you're allergic. That's just carry an EpiPen. Carry an EpiPen if you're allergic. If you are a curious love bug, which I know you are, and want to know why it hurts and what's in the venom, let's talk about what's actually in the venom because I think that's very interesting. The makeup of the venom starts with acetylcholine and histamines. This stimulates the immune system. Many wasp and bee stings, they hurt a lot because they're just triggering your immune system. They just want you to hurt. They're doing more like kind of making your immune system work and turning on your pain receptors, then they are necessarily hurting you physically by damaging cells, mostly just painful. After that, we have little molecules called kinins, which are responsible for dilating your blood vessels. And then we have phospholipases and 
mastoparins, which are not found in honeybee venom, but these two chemicals are specifically responsible for digesting and breaking down cell and muscle tissue. So that's what's going on in this thing. That's why it hurts, it circulates in your blood system. This is how these insects are eating their food. They eat other insects, so they need to kill them somehow, and they do that with a stinger. Also convenient, because they are eusocial, they can use a stinger, then they also like protect themselves. How will they affect the environment? We aren't really sure. It's too new to know. We know that their biggest threat is to honeybees because that's what they like to eat. What's really the big deal about them if they're not so dangerous to you and they're probably not going to spread that far, the big concern is beekeeping because they do eat bees and that's where a lot of the worry is. A lot of the worry is literally like economic damage to our agricultural system, both with the beekeeping and also with pollination of crops because if your bees are dying, then you see where that goes. How are they going to affect native species? We're not really sure. We don't know if they are going to have a significant effect on like, like solitary pollinators like bumblebees. They do generally eat other insects, so they could potentially pose a threat. Are they going to pose enough of a threat? We don't know. We have also seen them going after paper wasp nests, so they, they may go after native species that are not solitary, are just more nesting in general, but we don't have enough information here about them and how they will interact with the ecosystem. That's something that we're just gonna have to take data on over time, unfortunately. We don't know. There's a lot of, it's new. It's a new problem. We don't know a lot of stuff yet. What normally eats them? Well, I know this is hard to think about, but the Asian giant hornet being a giant two inch insect that stings and flies is actually an apex predator. Not a lot of things take it down. This isn't the only insect that's kind of at the top of the food chain. Another good example is the pepsis or the tarantula hawk wasps, especially the big four inch ones. Nothing eats the adult females. Their exoskeleton is too hard to break through and their sting is too potent and toxic that literally like nothing eats the adult females. So the Asian giant hornet, if it has predators, they're going to be going after the nests. And so like some badgers go after, after hornets, bears go after hornets, for example, but they're going after the larva and not the adults, but the adults are big and can sting and hurt a lot and have a bigger stinger than a lot of these other stinging insects that could possibly penetrate bear or badger or whatever fur and skin. So uh, they don't really have a lot of predators even where they naturally come from. They're probably mostly taken down by maybe fungus, other diseases, bacterial and viral diseases take down insects, fungus can take down insects. So probably more in that aspect are they being taken down. There, there's you, you can eat them. If you want to exact your revenge and be like, get off of my country, <laughs> you can eat them. <laughs> There's a small village in Japan that considers them a delicacy and goes after them and eats all the larvae. So you could be eating Asian giant hornet off your plate and uh, that could be helping. Something to consider. And then I had a lot of people compare this to the news hype of the killer bees in the 80s. I was born in 1989. <laughs> I'm 32 now. And I did not really live through that. I remember watching one documentary in school about the killer bees and that was it. So I never saw that big hype of the 80s. So I'll just have to take your word for it that it was a thing and that it happened. The big concern about the Africanized honeybee was that it was a hybrid species that was basically a lab experiment go gone wrong. Like kind of all those ridiculous horror story things that you see in like movies and like lab stuff, like the fly. Like this was actually one of those. The idea of the Africanized honeybee was to produce a honeybee that produced more honey. They escaped the lab in Sao Paulo in 1956 and have since escaped all the way far up into the United States as California. They moved at about 100 to 200 miles per year 
which was a lot. And so by 1990, they were in Texas. And by 1995, they were in California. It seems that they're like running out of potential habitat though. There's a few places that still might be potential habitat for them, but we haven't seen them spread to those areas yet. So uh, that was one of the big concerns. They they did spread really fast and their more aggressive nature made people more worried. They will chase you further and they will attack more readily. They're not gonna just like attack you for no reason. You, ha you do have to be close to the nest, but they will fo follow you farther and they are more ready to sting. How do the Africanized honeybees p compare to Asian giant hornet stings or honeybee stings? Well, I mean, they're honeybees, so the potency is about the same as a honeybee. About 15 people per year die due to the Africanized honeybee. About a thousand reported deaths have been recorded since their initial escape, which when mathed out is about 15 deaths per year. And as we just talked about, the Asian giant hornet is about 30 to 50 deaths per year in their native range, and honeybees are about 62 deaths per year. So the Asian giant hornets actually aren't that aggressive. Justin Schmidt noted that the Asian giant hornets will like fly at you and snap their mandibles together and then fly back and like fly at you, fly back and like do this really intense motion with this really loud noise to be like, hey, you're too close, GTFO. And if you still stay there, then you get stung. But if you leave, you're gonna be okay. Like they're not that aggressive. Even still, like the Africanized honeybee was moving really far. It seemed to be more aggressive, but it seemed to be kind of more like media hype. So I feel like in that way, there is equal amount of hype around Asian giant hornet as there is the killer bee. I feel like in some ways the killer bees had more of a reason because they were spreading so fast and because it was kind of a lab experiment gone wrong and they were slightly more aggressive. I feel like even though the media press was overblown and fear mongering, it came, it was like more understandable and came from a more logical place than the Asian giant hornet. Well, my lovely love bugs, thank you for asking such good questions. I hope that this cleared everything up for you. Again, if you haven't watched last week's video about the Asian giant hornet 2021 update, you should do that. And also be sure to check out the playlist that will be, that's linked right here somewhere to watch all of the Asian giant hornet stuff that I have done. Some of it is a little bit older. Be sure to check the date because like now is more up to date than what I said last year. All right, my love bugs, I will see you next week in the next video. Until then, have a great week and I will see you very soon. Bye.